Good morning. My name is Bruce Williams. I am the president of the C.L. Davis Foundation, veterinary pathologist at the Armed Forces Institute of Pathology, and it's my pleasure today to talk to you about uh, gross pathology of the cat. But before I do that, I always take the opportunity to thank people who have helped me along in my career. And uh, today I'd like to thank Dr. Samuel Wesley Thompson. And a lot of you might not know the man himself or heard his name, but you certainly have benefited by the many things that he has done for our, uh, our specialty. Uh, Sam Thompson is the founder of the C.L. Davis Foundation, which he founded in 1970 with a grant of $1,500 from the family of, the, of Charles Lewis Davis, after whom we're named. Uh, what you see today, all the courses, all of the textbooks, all of the video tapes and video tutorials that we put together are the result of this man's vision. And if that wasn't enough, those of you who are familiar with the Society for Toxicologic Pathology, which is one of the largest organizations for pathologists in the world, that is also an organization founded by Sam W. Thompson. Sam continues to work for the C.L. Davis Foundation coming into our office every day. I hope that many of you have the opportunity to speak to him on the phone when you're contacting the foundation about registering for courses or buying some of the uh, uh, many materials that are made available. Sam puts in a 10-hour day and at 85 years of age that's more than any one of us can ask. Uh, my hat is off to you Sam and I will continue to do this just as long as you do. With that, uh, let's go ahead and talk a little bit about uh, pathology of the cat. Let's go on to the first slide. Well, as with most of, the, uh, most of my lectures, I start with the cardiovascular system. I don't know why, it just sort of works out that way. And cats have some, uh, some unique uh, diseases of the cardiovascular system, and we would be very remiss talking about the heart of the cat without talking for at least a little while on cardiomyopathy, which is still a problem in cats. Now, over the years, a number of causes of cardiomyopathy have, uh, and a number of manifestations of cardiomyopathy have been identified. Uh, in general, cats have three forms of cardiomyopathy. They have dilatative cardiomyopathy, where the uh, chambers of the heart are dilated. The heart itself is larger than normal, as we see in this picture, in which the heart takes up about 60 percent of the chest cavity. And other things that I will draw your, uh, your attention to in this illustration is um, the fluid within the chest cavity. This animal is in biventricular heart failure, so you will have uh, right-sided heart failure resulting in uh, pleural effusion, fluid in the chest, and ascites. Uh, also another manifestation of right-sided heart failure that we can see in this animal is the nodularity of the liver as a result of chronic congestion. There is also pulmonary edema, which is difficult to identify grossly in this picture, but which is the result of left-sided heart failure. We see dilatative heart failure in a number of other species, um, and it's one of those diseases I think that you can extrapolate a lot about from what you know uh, in the cat. Uh, it's a common problem in ferrets. It is a common problem in certain exotic species, including the black rat snake, and there are a number of causes in the dog. What I'd like to talk about are some of the, the identified causes of dilatative cardiomyopathy in the cat. We have known for many years that a decrease in, uh, in taurine has been associated with the uh, incidence of dilatative cardiomyopathy in a cat, especially middle-aged male cats. And back in the 1970s, the number of uh, cases of cardiomyopathy decreased markedly as taurine became a, uh, an added ingredient uh, in all types of cat food. So, but if you have cats that are on a low taurine diet, uh, you can uh, cause cardiomyopathy in those animals. But today, continued research into this problem, which is still around, and the uh, dietary change has not eliminated all cases, have identified a number of other causes. Uh, 
the antigen for feline parvovirus or panleukopenia virus has been identified in all types of cardiomyopathy in the cat. And we do know that in humans, viral infection of the heart, especially Coxsackie virus, has been associated with cardiomyopathy. So there may be a, uh, a viral uh, cause in some cases of cardiomyopathy. In addition, we do see these in, in certain breeds of cats. Uh, including Persians in a higher incidence. And some genetic mutations and altered proteins in these animals have been identified, uh, which result in the shortening of telomeres and ultimately apoptosis of cardiac muscle cells. So it appears that it might be a multifactorial problem, um, and I'm sure that excellent research is, is continually being done on this problem in the cat. Uh, to go back to, uh, to the gross appearance of these hearts, you often will see bilateral uh, ventricular dilatation. The endocardium may be white and thickened. And in cases of uh, uh, a cardiomyopathy, especially for young residents, the first thing that I want people to look for microscopically is fibrosis. The key to this disease, the key to cardiomyopathy is the presence of fibrosis and myocardial necrosis and loss. And without fibrosis, I don't think that you can make a justification of cardiomyopathy. It's very common uh, in a uh, diagnostic laboratory to get submitted hearts, uh, especially with uh, people looking for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. But a good Massons trichrome that does not disclose the presence of fibrosis probably rules out diagnosis of cardiomyopathy. Some forms of cardiomyopathy, the fibrosis may be associated with fatty infiltration as well. And I rarely see a fat in the heart of a cat that does not have severe cardiomyopathy. Because this heart is dilated, because the valves are mildly damaged and you have turbulent blood flow. Animals with uh, cardiomyopathy will often throw aortic uh, emboli. And we'll look at that in just a minute. But whenever you think about cardiomyopathy, I want you to think about aortic embolization. Now here's the other common type of, uh, of cardiomyopathy. And I want you to take a look at the, these are hearts from two different animals, but they show the same change. In both cases, depending on how the, uh, the heart has been cut, you can see that the interventricular septum and the uh, left ventricular free wall are both thickened and more importantly, lighter in color. They exhibit pallor. And we, when we talk about something becoming lighter in, in color, and thicken, it's generally because something has been added. The most common thing that is added is cells. And in the case of cardiomyopathy, you are adding extra normal cardiomyocytes in odd arrays, but it's thickened due to the addition of normal structures. Okay, now let's look at this. Uh, the, the heart on the bottom right hand of the screen it is very obvious to tell that you have a marked decrease in the lumen of the left ventricle. Okay, and you might even say that the left atrium is somewhat dilated, and that's a judgment call. If you look at the larger picture where the cross section has been done through the middle of the heart, you can see also that there is marked diminution of the left ventricle chamber. Now this can be a very tricky way and it's a poor way to cut a heart for a simple reason that if you cut the heart near the apex, you are going to give yourself a false positive reading of chamber, uh, concentric chamber or wall hypertrophy because the chamber is normally very narrow down there. So don't cut your heart that way. The thing that, that makes me feel better about this diagnosis in this heart that's been cut cross-section is the fact that you do have that pallor there because we've added a lot of extra cells. In, when you look at the microscopic, because 
It is not uncommon if you work in a diagnostic lab that a practitioner will send you a heart of a cat and say, I think this cat had hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And sometimes they'll even cut it for you, which is just the worst thing that they can do. And they'll see a small chamber and they'll say, it had hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Usually means that the animal died suddenly or died under anesthesia with no premonitory signs. Okay, and this is often a fairly unrewarding microscopic diagnosis. As we said before, with dilatative cardiomyopathy, the various forms of cardiomyopathy all have one thing in common, and that is fibrosis. Now, the textbooks will say that you will see in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy a interweaving or disarray of the fibers. And, and I have found in almost 25 years of uh, looking at tissues through the microscope, that is a very difficult call to make in the heart of a cat. So I have the vast majority of hearts that I've submit, been submitted uh, for examination on cats with supposed hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, I have not been able to confirm that diagnosis. I think there are some that I probably should have, but I didn't get the right section. So hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Okay, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy as a syndrome is associated with a metabolic problem which is common in cats, and that is hyperthyroidism. About 85% of hyperthyroidism, hyperthyroid cats have cardiac lesions because the elevated levels of thyroid increase the metabolic rate and increase the tissue demand for oxygen, and the heart, in a compensatory fashion, will beat harder and faster and more rapidly to supply the increased oxygen demand, okay? And they will develop hyperthyroidism, okay? The other possibility, and this is pretty rare, but whenever you see this, think about the possibility of aortic stenosis. Congenital valvular problems in cats are the most form of congenital heart disease. Uh, in most species, uh, you can have malformations of uh, the blood vessels and, and structures, uh, or atrial or ventricular defects. In cats, the most com common congenital problem are valvular dysplasias. And if you have a stenotic aortic valve, you're going to get the same concentric left ventricular hypertrophy to try and force the blood out through that uh, very small valve. So that's just another thing to think about when you see uh, enlargement of the left ventricular free wall. A very nice picture uh, from Paul Stromberg. But as we look at the distal aortic bifurcation, you can see that there is a embolus within there, which includes blood flow. And people use the term saddle thrombus. Realize that the majority of these are not thrombi. There is no damage to the wall down there no uh, uh, endothelial damage, so these emboli won't stick there. As a matter of fact, sometimes they can be snaked out by the astute surgeon. So these are, are aortic emboli. Uh, much more common in dilatative cardiomyopathy, uh, but you can also see them in about 10 to 20 percent of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy cases as well. Uh, the astute pathologist out there uh, will notice that there are uh, changes associated. There are multiple chronic infarcts in that, uh, uh, the kidney in the slide as well. And this is what you will see in the hind, M, uh, hind limbs of this cat. There will be no pulse. The pads will be cyanotic and the feet will be cold. heartworm disease in cats. The cat is an aberrant host for heartworms, which means a number of things. Uh, number one, this is a large amount of worms for a small heart. Obviously, the smaller the animal, the smaller the worm load that it can, uh, that it can carry. Uh, in areas with a high incidence of heartworms, uh, such as New Orleans, where almost 50% of dogs have heartworms, 
only about 2% of the cats have heartworms. And, and uh, um, it may be that cats are indoors and have less exposure to mosquitoes. Uh, could simply be that cats are less appetizing than uh, bigger dogs to mosquitoes, but it's not a common occurrence. And they are a barren host. They have many of the same uh, cardiac and pulmonary changes that dogs do. But because they have a smaller heart, they often have lower worm burdens, and it increases the chance of having unisex uh, infections in the heart. So obviously, uh, it's going to be very difficult to pick up circulating microfilaria. Antigen tests are required. Something else that you will see in aberrant hosts is aberrant migration. This is a heartworm that ended up in the ventricles of a cat brain. Okay, leaving the uh, cardiovascular system, let's move on to the hematopoietic system. And we are looking at the chest of a young cat, probably less than two years of age, and there is marked uh, infiltration of the thymus with neoplastic lymphocytes. And as a pathologist, I must decry the invention of the feline leukemia vaccine. As a veterinarian, I am proud and happy and it has saved millions of cats' lives. Okay? It has made the pathology of the cat just a little more dull because what has happened is we have taken out most of the uh, juvenile lymphomas in cats which are T-cell based. Okay? When lymphoma is caused by feline leukemia, uh, these are usually T-cell lymphomas, and they are more likely to develop mediastinal and multicentric forms of lymphoma, the classic lymphomas that we saw 20 or 25 years ago. Today, what we see uh, in diagnostic practice is primarily uh, alimentary. It used to be 80% were T-cell, now probably 80 or 90% are B cell, usually alimentary lymphomas, large granulocyte lymphomas are also B cells, which have risen from about 10% of our lymphomas 10 years ago to 30 or 40% today. So it's taken out a lot of very interesting cases of lymphoma. We still see them, not every animal is tested or vaccinated. We see them from time to time, but the widespread use of the feline leukemia vaccine has really taken away a lot of these lymphomas. And this is what we see today. You can see that the arrow at the bottom right points to a, uh, a thickening of the lumen of the gut. The mesenteric lymph node is markedly enlarged and filled with neoplastic B cells, likely B cells. The majority of alimentary lymphomas in most species are of B cell origin. But in the old days, you would see lymphomas just about in any organ. I've always said that the lymphoma is going to do whatever it wants. It's going to go wherever it wants, and you may see it in very specific places. In the upper left-hand corner, we see the heart of a cat. It is misshapen. It is lumpy, bumpy. And you can see uh, through the epicardium that there are just large areas of the myocardium which have been replaced by a white cellular infiltrate, which is malignant lymphoma. Uh, John King used to tell his residents that he had a cat heart under the table. What did it have? And the answer was always lymphoma. Cat hearts don't get a lot of things, but lymphoma is one that, that they do get as part of the multicentric form. Uh, clockwise from there, we have lymphoma, uh, epidural lymphoma of the spinal cord in the cat. The bottom right-hand corner, we have lymphoma of the kidney. Bottom left-hand corner is lymphoma of the skin of the cat. Uh, bottom line is you can see it anywhere. It is the most common malignancy in some uh, organ systems, it is the most common neoplasm overall. If you look at the presenting signs of a cat with lymphoma, 
it often will lead you to where is the first and the best place to look. Now we've looked at nodular lymphomas in the cat. We saw it in the intestine. We saw, okay. Sometimes in certain species you will get visceral enlargement as a presenting sign for lymphoma. In this cat we have uh, marked uh, enlargement of the spleen and the liver. Okay, one thing about the spleen, if you notice in this spleen you have some, some pretty significant folds within it, and that's very normal for a cat. Cats can have very bizarre looking spleens with wrinkles and folds and, and odd angles, and that's not abnormal, but the size is markedly abnormal. Uh, this is not a case of lymphoma, uh, but certainly it could be. So think, when you look at marked splenic or liver enlargement in any species, I want you to think about the possibility of lymphoma, very common in rodent species, where they don't get nodular lymphomas, but they get diffuse visceral uh, enlargement. This actually is a case of uh, visceral mast cell tumor in the cat, which uh, is another, should be on your differential diagnosis for neoplasms of the intestine and or spleen microscopically they can look very close because uh, visceral mast cell tumors in cats often are very poorly granulated they don't have a lot of eosinophils uh, in them so they often will take special stains to either bring out metachromatic granules or special immunohistochemistry to identify uh, which process is going on Not every neoplasm, but the vast majority of neoplasms of the thymus are the result of lymphoma. Uh, if you look at the right, we see a very nodular mass, which is incorporating the thymus of this cat. Uh, probably 98 times out of 100, you'll be dealing with uh, lymphosarcoma. However, in this case, this is a thymoma. Remember, thymoma is generally an epithelial tumor, okay? Because the thymus has many lymphocytes, especially in younger animals, it can be very difficult to make that diagnosis. And so I would look for corroborative evidence, a positive keratin on this particular uh, uh, tumor would be something very good to have. Within the last five or six years, there have been a number of publications uh, on cats with thymomas having an exfoliative dermatitis, as we see in the upper right hand, or excuse me, the upper left hand corner. The skin is dry, it's shiny, it's somewhat hyperkeratotic, and the hair falls out very easily. Um, this has been associated with thymoma in the cat and also in the rabbit. So, thymoma associated exfoliative dermatitis. We are looking at the abdomen of a cat. And the first thing that should jump out of you is that there is abundant, very thick, viscid uh, effusion within the abdomen. You could call this a high protein ascites. The protein generally will be above five milligrams per deciliter. So it's very, it's difficult to see through. I refer to this as a honey colored exudate. And there is, this is very characteristic for what is seen with coronavirus infection in the cat. The disease is called feline infectious peritonitis. And we will look at a number of pictures of these. We'll look at a number of manifestations of feline infectious peritonitis in the cat. The causative agent of feline infectious peritonitis is a coronavirus. Now, there are, there is a coronavirus which is known, which is an enteric coronavirus in cats, which causes mild enteric disease. And this virus is antigenically and morphologically indistinguishable from the same virus that causes the condition of feline infectious peritonitis. The current therapy today in 2011 is that the feline enteric coronavirus is able to 
mutate to the point where it can replicate in macrophages. And when the virus can replicate in macrophages, then the multiple manifestations of feline infectious peritonitis will occur in the cat. Now I want you to look at this picture carefully. We know that there are two forms of FIP in the cat, the wet form, and this is a very nice presentation, and the dry form in which you get granulomas in multiple organs. The nervous system is an organ where you get the predominance of granulomas in uh, the dry form, but you can see it in any species. Now we have this very high protein exudate. What that tells me is that you have vasculitis. When you have vasculitis, you have an outpouring of protein, edema fluid, sometimes even hemorrhage. We can tell a lot about the immune function of the cat affected with FIP by what type of disease it manifests. There are four forms. You have, you have the cat who has good, who has totally no immunity to this virus. When it becomes able to replicate macrophages, animal has no immunity, it dies fairly quickly. And then you have animals which have good humoral immunity. The animals infected, they have good humoral immunity, they immediately start forming antibodies to try and clear this virus, but they don't. To clear the FIP virus, this coronavirus, you need both humoral and uh, uh, cellular immunity. Animals that have both humoral and cellular immunity clear the virus. So we have the ones that have no immunity, they die. The ones that have both cellular and humoral, they clear it. If you have just humoral, you will not clear the virus, but you will form lots of antibodies. And eventually you will form so many antibodies and antigen antibody complexes in the bloodstream that they will precipitate out into the vessels of the body. They lodge in the basement membrane, they depolarize the basement membrane, the basement membrane of all these vessels become extremely leaky, pouring out this high protein fluid. Okay? So looking at this picture, I can tell you this animal is infected with feline enteric coronavirus, which is mutated, and we have uh, the animal has good humoral immunity. If the animal has good cell media immunity, it will be able to form granulomas. You have granulomas throughout the body. But the animal will still eventually succumb to the disease. Now, it's bad enough that the antibodies coat, you know, they, they form these complexes and they are deposited and result in a severe vasculitis. But it gets even worse because the antibodies also opsonize the viruses. The viruses are taken up by macrophages, which increase cytokine production and promote further vasculitis due to endothelial liquid, uh, leakage. So it's a, it's a very complex disease um, and not very uncommon either. Just another picture of a cat with a wet form of disease. I would direct your attention to the abundant fibrin. The part of the um, high protein uh, uh, exudate is fibrinogen, and this will polymerize into fibrin. You see massive adhesions in the abdomen of these animals. Okay, let's leave FIP for a moment. I'm sure we will be coming back to it. There are two morphologic diagnoses in this particular slide of note. Number one is icterus. Note the yellowish color to the fat in this cat, and that would be very abnormal for a cat. The second morphologic diagnosis directly in the center of the image is splenomegaly. Now, there are a number of things that can cause icterus in a cat, but when you add splenomegaly, you have to consider uh, intravascular excuse me, erythrocytic parasites or other causes of uh, either severe extravascular or intravascular and extravascular hemolysis. In this particular case, we are dealing with an erythrocytic parasite, which is transmitted by arthropods, which when I went to veterinary school was known as hemobartonella uh, and caused the disease infectious feline anemia. 
Okay, the organism has been renamed today. There are actually several forms, but today it goes by the name of Mycoplasma hemophilus or Mycoplasma hemomenutis. It used to be more common in animals that are, were immunosuppressed, especially due to feline leukemia, but we still see it today in lesser numbers. And Mycoplasma hemophilus has the ability to, uh, to cause severe life-threatening infections in immune-competent cats. In most cases, you will see extravascular hemolysis, okay? The organism is attached to the uh, erythrocyte. It causes changes to the erythrocyte membrane and then is taken out of circulation in the spleen and the reticular endothelial cells of the spleen the spleen gets very large due to a proliferation in the reticular endothelial component of the spleen. Uh, in severe cases, you will see icterus. Ultimately, the animals will become anemic. And if you look at the bone marrow, you'll see marked erythrocytic hyperplasia. Uh, cl good clinical pathologists can usually detect it on a routine blood smear, but there are PCR tests which are available for uh, diagnosis of this agent. This is one additional uh, image of a blood parasite that is seen in cats throughout the uh, uh, southern United States. The organism is known as cytozoan felis, and there are two or three morphologic diagnoses on this uh, this particular slide. One is, is marked hepatomegaly with necrosis and hemorrhage. And the second one, multifocal coalescing pulmonary hemorrhages. And cytozoan felis is a, a blood parasite which has two stages. It has an asexual reproductive stage in macrophages where most of the damage takes place because these macrophages get extremely large when they have the uh, when they have the parasite in them, and they result in occlusion of small vessels and hemorrhage. That is a life-threatening. If the animal survives that, then it will go on to a sexual phase in erythrocytes. And when it's in the erythrocytes, it doesn't cause any problem for the animal, and it facilitates its transmission to another susceptible host. But when you are in the asexual reproductive phase in the macrophages, these are very easy to see microscopically because the macrophage is swollen, you know, five or more times normal size, and then you get occlusion. You get tremendous proliferation of the macrophages, uh, circulating histiocytes with the parasites, and they will occlude small vessels. This is the reason that we have hemorrhages throughout the lung as they occlude the pulmonary capillary bed. Moving on to the gastrointestinal system. Let's start at the front and go to the back. And as I, I do like to sprinkle my lectures with uh, images from my own pets, and this is one of my cats uh, a number of years ago who had significant problems. Um, but this was one that sort of went under the radar because he had concomitant uh, hypertrophic, or excuse me, dilatative cardiomyopathy and hyperthyroidism. But uh, we are looking at the, uh, the teeth and you can see that there has been a gingivectomy here. And along the, the top of the teeth, there is a reddened uh, gingiva, which has abundant uh, inflammation and uh, granulation tissue. But if you take that off, you can see that up underneath the gum line, you know, underneath the enamel, because the subgingival tooth is not, does not have a complete layer of enamel. So right underneath the enamel, you have these deep grooves. And this is a condition that has received a tremendous amount of interest in the last 10 or 15 years, especially in, in, among feline practitioners and dentists. These are known as ORLs, or osteoclastic resorptive lesions. And they usually start in the subgingival area. Um, underneath the, uh, the gingival sulcus, the tooth is not covered with enamel, so odontoclasts 
I don't know why they call it, don't call it odontoclastic resorptive lesions, but the odontoclasts resorb the cementum, which is a layer underneath the enamel. And they just sort of keep burrowing away uh, until eventually they either get into the pulp cavity or they just resorb the root and the tooth breaks off. And the cause of this uh, has not been identified. Supposedly is a painful condition, although my particular cat, speaking from experience, never really showed any, any pain on this. But uh, these are osteoclastic re resorptive lesions and usually affected teeth are removed. This is the first manifestation that we will look at. We will look at other ones, but this is the first manifestation of the eosinophilic granuloma complex in the cat. Uh, this particular lesion, which is common on the uh, gums, the oral cavity, and the lips of the cat, has been known by a range of very poor names, including rodent ulcers uh, or indolent ulcers. And even the term eosinophilic granuloma uh, is, is somewhat difficult to prove in the vast majority of biopsies you see. Uh, but it is common around the, the oral cavity. It can be either ulcerative or proliferative if you have a large granulation tissue component. And don't be thrown because the vast majority of biopsies that you get from these lesions are taken after the animal has had the condition for months if not years, and it can be very difficult to identify and identify any eosinophils in the biopsy lesion. Uh, you can often see them early on in large numbers, but a lot of times you will get the, the history of a cat with an ulcerated lesion on the lip, and all you will see is fibrous connective tissue and lymphocytes and plasma cells, and that should not really put you off of a diagnosis of indolent ulcer but it doesn't help you confirm it either. So this is one, and we're gonna look at two more manifestations later on in the lecture when we get to the skin. And as I said before, sometimes if you have a lot of granulation tissue, these eosinophilic uh, granulomas or indolent ulcers, it's not really ulcers, the eosinophilic granulomas can be seen anywhere in the mouth. Uh, anything under the tongue in a cat, I really like to think of squamous cell carcinoma first, but uh, this one turned out to be an eosinophilic granuloma. Looking at the tongue of the cat, you can see in the larger picture that the cat has multiple raised vesicles. So this is a multifocal vesicular glossitis in the cat. And then on the inset, you can see that there is a large denuded ulcer. And this is one of the manifestations of feline Khaleesi virus infection. Khaleesi viruses can cause vesicles in a number of species. Okay, Khaleesi virus in sea lions causes raised vesicles on the liver. The virus itself in the epithelium is cytolytic. So, you know, you have initial infection, and then as those cells die, you have an infection of cells around it, and the the uh, uh, the blister initially grows centripetally, it grows outward, eventually because those cells are necrotic, it ruptures, and then you are left with a ulcer. Uh, you can see the ulcers all over the tongue. You can also see them uh, on either side of the midline of the hard palate. So you can see them, you know, throughout the oral cavity, and they tend to heal in about 10 to 12 days. The virus itself at this time can be isolated from the palatine tonsils. And this is a very mild form of Khaleesi virus. We're gonna talk a lot about Khaleesi virus. You can see it in cases of respiratory disease, uh, both upper and lower. You can see it in uh, a new syndrome which has been identified by Dr. Patty Pesavento at the University of California, Davis. Uh, in shelter cats, which have all of these signs and also have a necrotizing dermatitis and pancreatic necrosis, which has a much higher morbidity. But this is often an early sign uh, of Khaleesi virus infection. Khaleesi virus has been uh, incriminated in a large number of cases of uh, chronic stomatitis, 
as well as chronic rhinitis. It can often be identified by, from carrier animals and probably gets a worse reputation than uh, it truly deserves. And animals that are infected with Klesiovirus may have concurrent infections with other common viruses, such as uh, feline herpes virus type 1. So we'll look at Khaleesi virus again shortly. Okay, this is, a, uh, this is a lesion that has been around for quite a long time. The name and the pathogenesis of the lesion continues to change and develop. Uh, for many years, this was known as plasma cell stomatitis. And it is a... Uh, it is characteristically seen in this area of the cat's mouth where the minor salivary gland ducts emerge, also known as the fauces. Um, and you have these sort of denuded, ulcerated areas with abundant granulation tissue, which gives it that sort of red, velvety look. And when you biopsy them, they're primarily lymphocytes and plasma cells, especially plasma cells, and it's been given the name plasma cell stomatitis. Okay, recently there it has been renamed necroulcerative falsitis or acute necroulcerative falsitis, and the the uh, uh, the theory is that it is a reaction to a change in the bacterial flora deep within the gingiva. And it all makes a little bit of sense, but I don't think it's been totally worked out. Now, the treatment for this is to remove the cat's teeth. Remove the teeth, you don't have the flora down there, and these lesions do regress significantly. Over the years, it's been associated with feline Khaleesi virus, feline leukemia virus, feline immunodeficiency virus, but nobody has been able to uh, really identify a particular cause. Okay, You can also get in much smaller areas adjacent to teeth, on the lips adjacent to the teeth. You can get uh, kissing ulcers, um, which are a reaction to dental tartar. So I think that, you know, the whole thing is probably some sort of continuum. In a low number of cats with this condition, you may have a polyclonal gammopathy. Remember, there's lots and lots of plasma cells in here. And some cats even have concurrent plasma cell pododermatitis, which we'll look at when we get to the, uh, uh, to the skin. So this is acute necroulcerative falsitis. Some people call it feline ulcerative stomatitis. And the classic name has been plasma cell stomatitis. Lovely picture uh, from Lois Roth. William's rule of red guts. Number one for the dog and the cat is that if you see red intestine, think of parvovirus first. In cats, feline parvovirus causes panleukopenia. And parvoviruses are replication deficient viruses, which mean they need help replicating. And so this virus has to infect cells in a certain stage of the cell cycle. And the window changes because when the animal is first born or in utero, there are a lot of cells that are in this stage. Um, so the, you can have widespread systemic infections. So in the developing kitten, you have certain cells in the brain, which we'll look at later, that are infected. Uh, in dogs, less than two weeks, you can have infections of the heart. But as the animal ages and becomes, you know, an older kitten or an adult or less and less uh, cells in an appropriate stage of the cell cycle, which parvovirus can infect and can replicate in. In the adult animal, it is generally the crypts of the intestine, the bone marrow, and the lymph nodes. So that is what your, where your uh, infections will be. Morphologic diagnosis here is a diffuse necrohemorrhagic enteritis. Remember, we have very few truly hemorrhagic lesions. The true lesion here is necrosis, but you do have hemorrhage. And these animals die of a combination of severe enteritis and usually a degree of endotoxemia. Now, in the cat, you can have very similar signs, including crypt necrosis, along with 
feline leukemia virus infection. And this gross lesion could truly be also feline leukemia virus. The difference between feline parvovirus and feline leukemia virus is that feline leukemia virus uh, will also affect the colon, where feline panleukopenia or feline parvovirus will not. If you have a strictly colonic infection, I would think feline leukemia virus. Okay, if you see um, other, other signs of uh, uh, cerebellar hyperplasia, lymphoid atrophy, I might go with parvovirus. And uh, very difficult to tell on a picture, but parvovirus infection in the dog and cat has a very characteristic sewer-like odor, which you will not see with feline uh, uh, leukemia virus infection. So a little bit about feline parvovirus in the cat, another disease we'll talk about again when we get to the nervous system. We are looking at a fixed section of intestine. And there are two things I would like you to notice about this, section, this section of intestine. One, it is curled up, it is pleated, it has an accordion-like appearance to it. And second, down the center of this section, you can see a linear, linear area of hemorrhage and a focal area of full, thick, full thickness mucosal necrosis. And this is what you see with linear foreign bodies in a cat. And cats can eat string or they can eat whatever all they want. The problem occurs when one end of the string is anchored. Normal peristalsis will probably ball it up and push it through the tract. However, if it is looped around the uh, tooth, catches on a tooth, or catches on uh, the base of the tongue, or any way that it is prevented from passing through, the intestine will continually you know, try and pass it through with peristalsis. It will get irritated. It will press harder and faster. And eventually that linear foreign body could even be a nematode parasite. But that linear foreign body is going to wear a hole in the intestine. So generally, tongue tooth. And sometimes they get, uh, they get hung up at the pyloric junction. So that's where you get. But if the, uh, if the string is not uh, anchored, it should pass through. Um, and sometimes we'll see kittens and puppies have eaten mop strings or whatever. And I always caution people, as a good practitioner, never pull. Okay, You can cut it off close to the anus, but never pull because you will do this to, to your animals. You pull it through. Well, we don't see a, a whole lot of problems, but uh, uh, in this particular cat, cats get a number, especially feral cats, will get a number of parasites. The larger worm is Physoloptera tumefaciens, okay, and it will anchor its head in the lining, so you can get something a little more systemic. The, the round worm is Toxicara cati which generally doesn't cause anything and causes a morphologic diagnosis, which we like to call diffuse catarrhal enteritis. Catarrhal is a descriptor which implies that there's a little bit of mucus, a little bit of inflammation, maybe a little bit of hemorrhage, a little bit of edema. And it's what we see when we have a parasite in the lumen of the intestine or maybe in a bronchi which is not anchored, it just sort of wiggles there on the surface and causes liberation of some of these products which go together to form catarrhal. If the parasite is not really anchored, you're not going to see a systemic reaction. You will not see peripheral eosinophilia. It will probably live fairly happily in the host unless it gets to a point where there are so many it causes obstruction or maybe one end becomes anchored and the body is unable to pass it out and can cause a linear foreign body type of reaction. Now this particular worm is causing a problem. Okay, this is the feline hookworm, Uncinarius stenocephala, or Ancelostoma brasiliense can cause this. And there are two morphologic diagnoses. There's a multifocal coalescing hemorrhagic and catarrhal enteritis, 
and the second thing is anemia. Uh, you have chronic blood loss, you will have ultimately a, a microcytic hypochromic anemia uh, in these animals. So this is a life-threatening condition whereas the other one is not. Well this is a, a section of intestine in which the mucosa is markedly thickened. It is thrown into these lumpy bumpy aggregates of cells which have infiltrated. In this case we are looking at infiltration of the mucosa by innumerable macrophages and multinucleated giant cells and this is a case of dimorphic fungal infection in the intestine of a cat. This is histoplasma capsulatum. It could be any of the others. It could be blasto or coccidio or cryptococcus but in the cat histoplasmosis is probably the most common. And you can see this in the dog, you can see this in a number of animal species, but uh, respiratory and intestinal infections are, are fairly common. Okay, uh, in the dog, about 50% of dogs with uh, uh, histo and blasto will have skin lesions. Not very common in the cat, they tend to get bone lesions more commonly. Well, we are looking at a cat with a massively dilated rectum, terminal colon, and rectum. And there are several possibilities for this. The first thing I would consider would be trauma. If the animal has a fractured pelvis, it will hurt to defecate, so they will just allow themselves to become obstipated. Okay, but there are other more interesting conditions. In the lower right, or excuse me, lower left-hand corner, you can see that uh, uh, this is a spinal cord that has been dissected out from a Manx cat which, with spina bifida. And Manx cats have a congenital predisposition. They don't have tails. They have a congenital predisposition for spina bifida. And the, the termination of the spinal cord is often abrupt and very confusing. And you can have deficient innervation to the pelvic organs, including the bladder and the, uh, the rectum. So this could be a Manx cat. And then this is occasionally seen in some white cats as a result of defective migration of neuroblasts from the neural crest uh, to the colorectal myenteric plexus. So it could be a deficiency in innervation due to deficient neural crest migration. So those are three possibilities for a cat with, uh, with megacolon. Looking at the uh, neoplasms of the GI tract in the cat, now that we have eradicated the majority of feline leukemia or FOCMA positive lymphomas in the cat, this particular neoplasm may be the most common neoplasm and certainly is the most common neoplasm in old cats. And one of the keys when you're looking at, at, the, at uh, uh, neoplasms of the oral cavity, especially the jaws, is if you have tooth, lo tooth loss, you're probably dealing with a, a malignant tumor. And in the cat, the number one most common neoplasm of the oral cavity is squamous cell carcinoma. We see one which is in the maxilla and is resulting in tooth loss. And then the second, a very common location, is the underside of the tongue or the tissue, soft tissues immediately beneath the tongue. It's a very common site for squamous cell carcinoma in the cat. It's about 60% of neoplasms which we see in old cats. And over the years there's been a number of uh, studies which have tried to uh, uh, show that these are caused by viruses. Um, and a recent study, probably about five years ago, um, showed an increased incidence of uh, squamous cell carcinoma in cats whose owners smoke. And uh, I don't know that much about that, but I do know that I had an ex-mother-in-law who was a very heavy smoker, and she had two cats, and they both died of oral squamous cell carcinoma. So you can draw your own conclusion from my experience with an N of two. We're looking at a section of uh, intestine, and the uh, wall has been uh, expanded 
to the, uh, uh, to the eventual occlusion of the uh, lumen by a neoplastic infiltrate of uh, neoplastic or malignant lymphocytes. This is a case of intestinal lymphoma, probably the most common neoplasm of the uh, gastrointestinal tube in the cat. Another possibility that should be considered, but which usually does not uh, get to this degree, would be uh, intestinal mast cell tumor. And our last uh, neoplasm for uh, this hour is a neoplasm that you can see uh, is in the center of this excellent picture from Iowa State University, and this is an intestinal adenocarcinoma. We can see these uh, in the GI tract, anywhere from the stomach through the colon. And the difference between the primary adenocarcinoma and what we see with the lymphoma is the adenocarcinomas. Carcinomas have the ability to cause formation of fibrous connective tissue. And over time, fibrous connective tissue will contract. And so what we get is a napkin ring effect. Um, this is also occlusive, and if you look at this particular uh, uh, picture, we have a very focal neoplasm in the center, which is occluding the, the GI tract. In front of that, we have a markedly dilated sac-like intestine because the food is unable to get past this contraction. And behind it, we have a very thin, empty intestine because no food is going through there. So this is an intestinal adenocarcinoma. Uh, with a profound scarce reaction resulting in obstruction. If you can excise this, the animal has a much better chance at uh, a longer life than uh, one of those animals with lymphoma or mast cell tumor. With that, I think we will uh, end this hour and we will start the next hour with a review of the liver and pancreas of the cat. Okay, let's uh, move on here into the hepatobiliary and pancreatic systems. If you uh, have ever worked with cats or you do posts on cats, this is a, uh, uh, not an uncommon finding. Uh, we're looking at a diffusely yellow liver. The liver is enlarged. We have a very prominent uh, pattern to the liver. And sometimes that can be very difficult to tell whether you're looking at a central ovular or a, uh, a portal pattern. This one happens to be portal. And the liver is yellow because there is a tremendous amount of fat in the liver. If you took a slice of this and you dropped it into a uh, bucket of formalin, it would probably float. And this is a condition known as uh, hepatic lipidosis in cats. Now you can see fatty liver in a number of species as a physiologic finding, but only in a small number of species, uh, including the cat, uh, the guinea pig, and the sheep, um, is hepatic lipidosis a true pathologic condition. And this is usually seen in overweight cats that go off food for a variety of causes. Um, there is, in some animals, there's no uh, identifiable cause for this syndrome, but you can see in cats uh, with diabetes. You can see cats that go off food for a number of problems. And, and the issue is in these animals, if you don't get them back on food, it becomes a, a vicious cycle. And the liver is flooded with, with fat, and it eventually will cause the animal to go into hepatic failure. Uh, cats with this problem can develop uh, icterus, uh, and with fulminant hepatic failure, they will develop elevated levels of blood ammonia and hepatic encephalopathy, and it can be a, uh, a life-threatening condition, or is often a life-threatening condition. Now note the full gallbladder in this animal. That's because these uh, hepatocytes are, are large. They have occluded bile canaliculi. It's very difficult for uh, uh, the bile to be uh, excreted. Um, in these animals. So they do develop a form of hepatic jaundice. There are actually two
findings of note in this particular slide, and both are considered to be incidental finding, findings in older cats, which don't really cause any problem. If you concentrate on the liver, that you can see that scattered across the liver there are uh, multifocal red depressed areas. Uh, this is a condition known as hepatic telangiectasia or telangiectasis. Uh, it's a finding that's also seen in cattle. And you can, uh, uh, it doesn't cause any problem. And there is simply a loss of hepatocytes. And those red areas are just large dilated blood filled spaces where the hepatocytes have just sort of of blipped out of existence. And it doesn't cause a problem, and it's seen in increasing uh, frequency with uh, older cats. And also, I want you to look in the upper left-hand corner of this slide, and we can see the duodenum and the pancreas. And note that the pancreas is filled with uh, multiple variably sized raised whitish nodules. And these are foci of hyperplasia of the exocrine or the acinar pancreas. These are not eyelets, but it's the, uh, the acinar pancreas. And this is a common older, old age finding in multiple species, including dogs, cats, and uh, uh, ferrets. So this is not a, a pathologic finding. The animal doesn't require any corrective surgery. And you see these uh, as the animal gets older. We don't know what causes them, but it doesn't cause any problem. This is a very nice picture from uh, Paul Stromberg at Ohio State University. And we are looking at a cross-section of the liver and the, all of the blood vessels, especially the central lobular veins and the portal areas, are outlined by a white cellular infiltrate. And this is a picture that you can see with a number of conditions. This animal happens to have a systemic infection with dimorphic fungi or yeasts. Being a cat, I would probably expect this to be histoplasmosis, um, but it could just as easily be any of the other uh, dimorphic fungi, including blastomyces dermatitidis, cryptococcus neoformans, and if the animal lives in California or the southwest, it could be coccidioides imitis. But in most cases, it's histoplasm histoplasma capsulatum. Now another possibility grossly in this animal is this could be lymphoma. Uh, there are multiple appearances to lymphoma, especially in the liver. Uh, you can see the large white raised nodules that we expect. You can see diffuse uh, infiltration which will cause a enlarged liver and often spleen as we saw earlier in this lecture. Or this particular pattern where you have uh, infiltration of the liver beginning at the area of the uh, venous circulation, you can see this in leukemic forms of lymphoma. Okay, this is still lymphoma, but you have large numbers of circulating uh, blast or even more bizarre forms of lymphocytes in the bloodstream, and it tends to come out first in the organs uh, at the areas of the venous circulation. So another way that you could have this very white infiltrate outlining all the vessels of the liver. Lovely picture from the AFIP. And this is the most common primary hepatic neoplasma. The cat's actually pretty, pretty common. And this is a biliary cystadenoma. These will grow. They can eventually take over the uh, the lobules, they're usually fairly superficial. And you can see that you don't have collapse of the lobule here by these large, largely fluid-filled spaces. Uh, you can also see that there are multiple hepatic cysts in the other lobes of the liver. So this is a biliary cystadenoma. There is a bit of uh, a controversy as to whether these are true neoplasms or maybe they are a congenital malformation. The fact that we have uh, multiple cysts in the other liver and we have this tumor which is in multiple lobes lends a little bit of credence to the, uh, uh, to the thought that maybe this is a congenital problem and not a true neoplasm at all. We're looking once again at the liver of a cat 
and there are multiple variably sized uh, nodules throughout all of the liver. And we talked before about if you see one large tumor, you want to think primary. A good example was the last one, those, that large biliary cyst adenoma. If you see multiple nodules of varying sizes throughout all lobes of the liver or the lung, you might want to consider a metastatic neoplasm. Another uh, thing that I would like you to see about this particular slide is that the center of these neoplastic nodules is depressed. And when you see that, we think about the possibility of metastatic carcinoma. As we said before, carcinomas tend to incite a profound desmoplastic response or the laying down of a dense fibrostroma. And over time, the fibrostroma will contract to the presence of myofibroblasts. And scar tissue likes to contract. And so the oldest part of these neoplastic foci tend to be drawn down, giving the tumors an umbilicated uh, appearance. And this is usually seen with carcinomas. I have trouble saying whether this is a primary carcinoma. We would think about biliary carcinoma or cholangiocellular carcinoma, which is the most common primary malignancy in the cat liver. But if you were to tell me that the animal had a large mammary neoplasm and this was metastatic mammary carcinoma, I wouldn't have any trouble with that either. We're looking at the abdomen of a cat. There are several things that I would like you to notice. Number one, you have the presence of large numbers of neoplastic foci scattered throughout the mesentery and omentum and abdominal cavity of this cat. And this is a condition that we see in cats with metastatic carcinoma known as carcinomatosis, where you often get these little seeds of carcinoma throughout the abdomen. Now, over time, you will see the same process going on as we see in carcinomas elsewhere where there is fibrous connective tissue put down. And so over time, you have fibrous connective tissue and this abdomen, the, the mesentery and the omentum will actually contract. And you get these little balls of tumor and fibrous connective tissue. The condition though is known as carcinomatosis. And when you get to the point where everything is contracted and formed adhesions, then if the animal has not succumbed to the tumor, it may develop a secondary problem with uh, GI obstruction, et cetera, and that might be a primary presenting sign. Two other things that you should note in this particular slide. Uh, the first one is on the right-hand side. If you look at the liver, it is very yellow in color, so this animal has hepatoclopidosis. We said we will see that in cats who are not eating, and I would imagine this would be a very good reason for the cat not to eat. And the third thing is that you have hemoperitoneum. Up around the top of the abdomen, you can see large areas of clotted blood. So I can't tell you whether it is due to the tumor or whether it is due to possible fracture of a friable uh, liver that is full of fat. So actually three good morphologic diagnoses on this. Very difficult in cats to identify the primary cause of this. This one ended up being a pancreatic exocrine carcinoma, which uh, commonly sees the abdominal cavity in the cat. But in most cases of carcinomatosis, it's very difficult to get a primary identification on the source of the neoplasm. This is an old picture from the AFIP. And we are once again looking at the opened up abdomen of the cat. We can identify the spleen. We can identify a kidney at the top of the picture. And you can see that all of the fat in this cat, and it's not just the fat of the mesentery and the omentum, you can also see that the fat of subcutaneous tissues is hard and a brown color. And if you were in the room when this animal was opened up, you would smell a very strong odor of rancid fish. This is a problem that used to be seen commonly in cats back in the 40s and 50s before uh, cat foods uh, were 
were formulated especially for cats. And these cats generally had fish in the diet. Um, and this is a condition known as uh, necrotizing steatitis. Also a very good morphologic diagnosis would be diffuse subcutaneous omental and mesoteric necrotizing steatitis. And the cause of this is a, either a very low concentration of vitamin E in the diet or maybe a high concentration of unsaturated fatty acids which rapidly deplete the animal stores of vitamin E which is used in an antioxidant uh, role in the body. And so all of the fat throughout the body will become oxidized and break down. You get that sort of orange yellow lipochrome pigment which gives it this characteristic color, coloration. So this is necrotizing steatitis. See it uncommonly today in cats. It can also be seen in other species. Um, there have been some reports of this actually in fish-eating birds, which seems an odd evolutionary thing, but uh, it really is not uh, the problem with these herons which eat fish, but a high concentration of hydrocarbons in the diet. So necrotizing steatitis, the animal and the necropsy room will smell for of fish for days. Moving on to the integumentary system of the cat, we're looking at the chin and perhaps the lips of a cat. And you can see that there are these large inflamed, greatly dilated hair follicles. This is known as feline acne and is primarily seen on the, the chin of the cat. And the condition is unknown as to what causes it. You will develop follicular hyperkeratosis, which uh, progresses to greatly dilated follicles full of keratin, which are known as comedones. Uh, eventually, these will rupture, giving you the condition known as furunculosis. And the extrusion of keratin uh, into the surrounding dermis will cause a profound pyogranulomatous response because the body does not like to have keratin anywhere within it. It just likes keratin on the outside in the hair or the nail. So when you release it into the skin, uh, you get a nice inflammatory response and that's what's going on in this cat. Eventually it could become secondarily bacterially infected. There is a similar syndrome in young short-haired dogs like Weimaraners or, uh, or German short-haired pointers. It is a, uh, not a severe disease and can be uh, readily treated. Well, this grumpy looking cat has a diffuse hyperkeratotic and proliferative dermatitis. It may or may not have a peripheral eosinophilia. Uh, and this crusting is the result. This animal is extremely pyritic. You can see that that there has been some excoriation of the face around the eyes and the nose. And this is a very grumpy, itchy, crusty cat. And this condition starts on the face. This is known as nodoedric mange. It is caused by the sarcoptic mite nodoedris cati. And you can see this in domestic cats. You can see this in wild cats. And cats can also be infected uh, by Sarcoptes scabii itself, but this is a very similar parasite um, that the, the infection starts on the neck and around the ears and eventually will become generalized. So this is nodoedric mane. Don't confuse this with the ear mite of dogs and cats, which is Ododectes cynotus. Ododectes uh, can be somewhat pyritic due to the large number of parasites which live in the ears, but it doesn't cause this crusting. It causes a, a lot of black wax within the ears. It generally does not spread out over the face or cause a crusting like we see with notoedric mange. We're looking at another crusty cat, but notice that the animal doesn't appear to be uh, traumatizing itself. We can see crusts over the eyes over the nasal plenum, a little on the ears, and these are white raised. It is a hyperkeratotic dermatitis, not especially proliferative. And this is what we expect to see with ringworm in cats. Cutaneous dermatophytosis 
is a problem in cats, dogs, where it's caused by, in both species, by microsporum canis. We can see it in a wide variety of livestock. Um, and there are, these are alopecic white crusty areas. Uh, this one's fairly easy to diagnose. It fluoresces very nicely on ultraviolet light. But you can also see dermatophytosis in cats. In young, especially Siamese cats or other lo or long-haired species of cats where there is no hair loss. And usually this is diagnosed with one, when one of the family members comes down with ringworm. So you can see it in young cats with absolute, absolutely no sign of hair loss or hyperkeratosis. One other thing in cats, dermatophytes, unlike in many other species, um, can live deep in the tissues. Normally dermatophytes uh, like dead tissue, dead skin, the, uh, uh, the outside line and the keratin lining of hair shafts is where these type of parasites prefer to live. But occasionally if you take an animal that has an established ringworm infection and you inoculate, perhaps this animal gets into a fight uh, in the uh, uh, and a, a claw will puncture one of those hyperkeratotic areas and inoculate the tissue. Or oftentimes you will see it in the paw pads of cats who, who uh, have ringworm and they're scratching themselves. Uh, and it's called uh, mycetoma or pseudomycetoma formation. And you will see colonies of uh, dermatophytes surrounded by abundant antigen antibody complexes or splendohora hopping material deep in the tissues. And these are large draining nodules, often around the paw pads or the face of cats with ringworm. So those are mycetoma or pseudomycetoma. Well, this is an awful looking cat, and we're looking at multiple draining tracts within the skin. And cats can We've seen before cats develop uh, several different types of dimorphic fungi, and the big four that we think about with our domestic species, our pets, blastomyces, histoplasma, uh, cryptococcus, and coccidial mycosis. I would like you to add one more to that list when you're dealing with cats, and that is a, a yeast known as Sporothrix schenkii. And Sporothrix schenkii is a normal uh, yeast that lives very happily in the soil. And when inoculated into cats or into people, you can develop draining nodules. It tends to spread up along the lymphatics. Uh, in horses, you can see a similar infection, which is known as uh, epizootic lymphangitis. Okay, that's also sporothrichosis. And, Histologically or microscopically, it looks somewhat different than uh, histoplasmosis. It's about the same size range, but if you look at a slide with sporothrix, eventually you will find some of the yeast that will be cut longitudinally. And when cut longitudinally, they are not nice and round like histoplasma, but they are cigar shaped. The main or elliptical, and the, most of these are seen within. Uh, macrophages. They're usually intracellular parasites and they live very well in there. They have the ability to evade the host defense mechanism. So uh, you can see these on cytologies or biopsies of nodules or ulcerated areas um, if you put a PAS or GMS. So look for those elliptical or cigar shaped organisms to rule out the possibility of sporothrix schenkii. In humans, you can see that in nodules of the hands of people who do a lot of gardening. Now, one of your differentials for this particular condition is on this cat, you can see that we have uh, a necrotizing area on the skin. If we wait a little longer, this skin and the attached hair would actually slough. Uh, we are looking at a new form of Khaleesi virus that has been identified within the last decade by Dr. Patty Pesavento, uh, who is an expert in shelter medicine or shelter pathology uh, at the University of California, Davis. 
And we looked earlier at the vesicles that you will see on the tongue of cats. And we're going to discuss respiratory infections due to Khaleesi virus in, uh, in when we get to the respiratory system. But there is a new, much more pathogenic variant of Khaleesi virus that has been identified primarily on the West Coast, but it is spreading. And in addition to the virus or the, the blisters that you see on the, uh, the tongue, these animals develop a necrotizing uh, dermatitis as well, and will slough areas of their skin. This particular variant, on top of all the usual uh, signs that you see, including the blisters in the mouth and the ulcerations and the upper and lower respiratory, they develop this necrotizing dermatitis and also pancreatic necrosis. And in normal Khaleesi virus, the, mor the morbidity and mortality is usually pretty low, at least the mortality is, morbidity is pretty high. But in this new strain, the mortality can be anywhere between 30 to actually 60%. These animals develop alopecia, ulcers, and subcutaneous edema. And part of it is that the virus hits endothelial cells. When you develop this necrotizing vasculitis, you have infarction of the overlying dermis. So, so that's a rule out for sloughing skin in a cat. And one more picture of a cat. This is a, uh, a cat with cryptococcus. And you can see a multifocal to coalescing ulcerative and pyogranulomatous dermatitis. And this animal was probably immune suppressed. For many years, Cryptococcus neoformans, which is now being reclassified, and there are a lot of different types, but neoformans was considered to be primarily a condition affecting immunosuppressed cats. It can, from time to time, affect immunocompetent animals, and there are some regional variants and subspecies of Cryptococcus, like Cryptococcus gadii, that can easily infect immunocompetent animals. And with cats, you normally see infection around the nose and the face, and ultimately the animals may inhale this and it may travel up the nasal passages, passing through the cryptoform plate. The cat is one of a, a pretty small number of species that will develop cryptococcal encephalitis through the respiratory tract. So ulcerative lesions, especially around the nose, I want you to consider cryptococcus neoformans. Well, here's a kitty cat, and we are a young cat, and we are looking at the area uh, in the back of the neck or between the shoulder blades, and we have a very well demarcated area of alopecia and uh, ulcerative dermatitis, usually associated with vasculitis. It's often seen uh, in areas where cats are vaccinated. It's not an area where the animal can traumatize, okay, or can readily get to. So this sort of takes it out of the realm of psychogenic dermatoses. This is known as the feline ulcerative dermatitis syndrome. The exact cause is unknown but uh, you do see it in animals that have been previously vaccinated, so it might be a vaccine response or a hypersensitivity. Um, in a biopsy of this, you often see an area of profound linear fibrosis across the biopsy and the subcutaneous tissues. Uh, so this is feline ulcerative dermatitis syndrome. Well, this poor cat has a condition where it has markedly uh, uh, thin skin. I, I want to thank Chelsea Martin for uh, sending me this photograph. It's just an excellent picture, and I think you can tell uh, how thin the skin is here. And it's just sort of peeled away. Uh, this is known as feline skin fragility syndrome. has been identified with a number of diseases, but primarily appears to be a manifestation of hyperadrenocorticism or Cushing's disease in a cat, although it's been identified also with diabetes mellitus, various forms of liver disease, and even a case or two of feline infectious peritonitis. And when you get a biopsy of this, and the jar tends to be curled up, uh, if you look at it on H&E or 
if you put a Misson's trichrome, you can see that the collagen is markedly reduced. The collagen fibers themselves are very thin, and usually at the edge of the biopsy, you see what appears to be a very clean tear. These animals have very uh, thin skin, which is obviously very susceptible to even minor trauma. They often have uh, some healing cuts or tears on their body, but they don't heal very well because they don't lay down collagen very nicely. Feline skin fragility syndrome. Earlier in the section on the GI tract, we looked at the first of the three forms of uh, eosinophilic granuloma complex in cats. Let's look at the next two. This is a cat, and you can see that uh, you have multiple raised pruritic plaques, although we can't tell it's, it's itchy, but I will tell you that this is itchy. The animal's constantly licking these, and this is known as the eosinophilic plaque. And you can see this anywhere in the animal's body, but they're raised, they're extremely pruritic due to the presence of eosinophils, large numbers of mast cells. Of the three, this is the one that invariably when you biopsy these, you will see large numbers of eosinophils. The conditions are known as eosinophilic plaques, but oftentimes you may not see eosinophils. It is rare in long-standing ulcers of the mouth to see them, but it's very common in long-standing eosinophilic plaques. And here's the third one, and I want you to note the very characteristic location on the backs of the thigh in a cat, and this is the third form of eosinophilic granuloma. This is known as the linear granuloma. You may see eosinophils in a biopsy. You will see large amounts of granulomous inflammation, some multinucleated giant cells. And the location and the scattering of eosinophils should lead you to a diagnosis of eosinophilic granuloma complex, specifically linear granuloma in the cat. We're looking at the paw pad, the uh, metacarpal or metatarsal pad of a cat. You can see in the upper right-hand corner the, uh, uh, the claw, that would be the, uh, the, the either fourth or the fifth phalanx. So the paw is actually facing downward. And you can see that this pad is markedly uh, expanded. When I was in practice in Georgia, this was referred to colloquially as pillow foot. But this is a condition that is known as plasma cell pododermatitis. We looked at plasma cell stomatitis earlier in the lecture. Okay, this may be seen or may not be seen and associated with that. Some cats have both. And when you biopsy this paw pad, you will see that the paw pad is full of plasma cells. Generally a soft, fluctuant, non-painful lesion. And the cause is, uh, is unknown. About 50% of these cats you know, years ago, we were identified as being positive for feline leukemia. We don't see a lot of feline leukemia these days, and we still see this problem. So um, probably in the old days, I think that the viruses, FELV, FIP, and uh, FIV, feline infectious or immunodeficiency virus, a lentivirus, were probably associated with a lot of conditions that they were not caused for. They were just seen in high prevalence in uh, in the cat population. But back to plasma cell pododermatitis. Uh, with these animals, you can see a range of additional signs. You do have lots and lots of plasma cells. What plasma cells do is they produce antibodies, so these animals may develop a hypergammaglobulinemia and other diseases associated with prolonged and profound release of antibodies. So you can see glomerulonephritis. You can even see amyloidosis in affected animals. Plasma cell pododermatitis. Well, this is a very angry and grumpy looking cat which has uh, marked alopecia and erosive dermatitis on the, the planum nasale. And if you look at the ears, uh, the same process is going on in the ears. And this is seen in cats uh, in areas where there are mosquitoes. Uh, this is a condition known as mosquito bite hypersensitivity dermatitis in the cats. 
allergens in the saliva of the mosquito cause a type 1 hypersensitivity. And this is a very common, uh, common distribution. The uh, nasal planum, the ears, you can also see it around the uh, uh, foot pads and perioculus. So generally lightly haired areas, if you biopsy this, you're going to see a deep mixed dermatitis with a predominance of eosinophils. Type 1 hypersensitivity, eosinophil and mast cell related. This is a condition that uh, about between 10 and 15 years ago first came on the scene. There's been extensive work done with this and we don't see it as much as we used to but we still see it on a fairly regular basis and we have a large malignant mesenchymal tumor at a site of previous vaccination between the shoulder blades. And this is known as the vaccine-related sarcoma. Um, it's sort of a misnomer because the vast majority of these are sarcomas. They, are, they happen to anywhere between uh, half a percent and in some areas up to 2% of cats who are vaccinated for either a feline a distemper panleukopenia or, or rabies. And the cause is not clear. It has been presumed to be the result of the various adjuvants which are put in the uh, vaccines, but nobody's really identified a particular adjuvant uh, which does this. And histologically, when you see these, you should have, a, a, based on the, uh, the aggressive nature and the site, you should have a, a pretty good idea you know, just by history of what this is. But you can see various types of sarcomas. The most common overall is a fibrosarcoma, but you can also see lyomyosarcomas, peripheral nerve sheath tumors, anything that, that uh, causes a marked proliferation of one of the various mesenchymal cell types present in the skin. Recently, there was a publication out of the AFIP of a vaccine-induced lymphoma. And histologically, what you're going to see is around this obvious malignancy of mesenchymal cells, you're going to see abundant lymphoid follicles and large numbers of macrophages. And the macrophages will be large and round, and they will be filled with a gritty gray material, which is vaccine material. So if you have the presence of both the neoplasm and abundant inflammatory cells with macrophages containing grayish material, very good likelihood that this is a vaccine-related sarcoma. These are incredibly aggressive malignancies. And after the first couple of years where these would appear on the backs of cats, the recommendation was made by, by the AVMA to start vaccinating cats in the hind limbs. And this is basically what you would get uh, with these malignant uh, mesenchymal tumors, this being a fibrosarcoma. You can see this neoplasm is pretty well replaced. The muscle is invading the bone. These are, this is how malignant these can be. And oftentimes, uh, these legs will be amputated. And then at the stump, the, uh, the tumor will continue to grow. So aggressive malignancies, uh, a high mortality associated with them, and a, a very poor prognosis. Let's look at a tumor that has a good prognosis in the cat, and you can see within the dermis, elevating the, the epidermis, is a cystic black neoplasm. The tendency for us, extrapolating what we know from other species, is to say, it's black, it's a melanoma. But in cats, the most common neoplasm of the skin of cats is a benign, largely benign tumor, uh, which has been referred to as the cystic and pigmented basal cell tumor. Some are primarily pigmented, as we see the one on the right. The one on the upper left, you can see the pigment, but it's very cystic. So you can see, you know, the either cystic ones or, or pigmented ones, and it has a pretty good prognosis. Now, some authors have reclassified this as a solid and cystic apocrinductular adenoma and rarely carcinoma. But I like the old term, the cystic and pigmented basal cell tumor. That's what it looks like. 
looks like a basal cell tumor um, with a lot of cystic areas and melanin pigment. We're looking at a white cat. And there are ulcers in front of the ears and around the eye. And maybe even uh, if you looked in the planum nasal, you'll see an ulcerative dermatitis. And this is actually beyond ulcerative dermatitis. These are squamous cell carcinomas. In cats, you have a wide variety of squamous cell carcinoma. It starts out in situ, often in front of the ears. That's known as Bowenoid or Bowens-like disease. And eventually, those large dysplastic epithelial cells will break through the basement membrane. You'll have frank invasive squamous cell carcinoma, as in other lightly pigmented species. We will see squamous cell carcinoma in areas which are exposed to ultraviolet light, and they do tend to uh, appear first in the lightly haired areas, which on the cat are in front of the ears. And here is one on the planum nasale. You can see there is ulceration and crusting. As we said before, my primary differential diagnosis for this particular condition, I would have to consider cryptococcosis a pyogranulominous inflammation, which often starts around the planum nasale. This is a neoplasm of the cat. This cat's been shaved. And the neoplasm was first described at the University of Pennsylvania by Mike Goldschmidt. And whenever I see these cats, it always looks like, or the pictures, once you shave them, it looks like they have had severe abdominal trauma, have been hit by a car. But what I want you to notice is not only the, the apparent discoloration, uh, which looks like diffuse bruising and subcutaneous hemorrhage, but I want you to notice the hair on the right-hand side and how it's matted with sort of a yellowish material. And this particular tumor is known as the ventral angiosarcoma of cats. Uh, these may be hemangiosarcomas, they're probably lymphangiosarcomas, but what you have is a, a diffuse spreading tumor on the ventral abdomen of these affected animals, and you get actual leakage of serum through these very leaky blood vessels which exudes through the skin. You can tell when this cat's been on your white bedspread because you have a large yellow nasty puddle. They don't make good house pets. It's not really something that can surgically be corrected. So this is the ventral angiosarcoma, something that's very specific and unique to the cat. It's a low-grade but spreading malignancy probably of, uh, uh, of the lymph system. And this is one more picture that I wanted to show. Uh, it's not the most diagnostic, but what I'd like you to see, we're looking at the hind limb of a cat in the area of the tendon sheath. And if you look, you'll see this very nice pinwheel or storiform appearance. And this is a neoplasm known as the giant cell tumor of soft parts. And histologically, you have a combination of uninucleate uh, cells which resemble fibrocytes. It's a histiocytic tumor. But, and then scare through, you have large giant cells with up to 60 nuclei. It's a very characteristic uh, gross appearance. And this gross specimen shows the, the uh, predilection of these tumors to rise in the area of the tendon sheath. And it has a very nice storiform pattern. So I included it, but it is something that is not generally diagnosed based on gross appearance. Let's move on to the nervous system of the cat. And we have two brains here from young cats. The normal brain is on the bottom, so that is your normal control. And you can see that the brain on top, there is a very small cerebellum. This is diffuse cerebellar hypoplasia, and it is one of the manifestations of feline parvovirus infection. In this case, the, the kitten was infected usually in utero, but it can be infected anywhere up to 10 days to two weeks after the animal is born. 
because we talked about how parvovirus is a replication deficient and I have to have a certain cell type and a certain stage of division in order to replicate. Well, during a particular window, which is late gestation up to two weeks after the animal has been born, you have cells within the external granular cell layer of the cerebellum, which will support viral growth. And so the virus will infect these and also the uh, Purkinje cells, which are still dividing. Okay, they're immature. They're not actually dividing, they're post-mitotic, but they're immature and they will also uh, support viral replication. So when the animal is infected in utero, the virus in, gets into the, the kitten's cerebellum and infects the cells of the external granular cell layer and those Purkinje cells. And if you kill off the external granular cell layer, those are the cells that form the rest of the cerebellum, including the internal granular cell layer. So you kill them off, you really don't have development of the cerebellum. You look at these uh, uh, cerebelli histologically, you will see a number of changes. You'll see marked disorganization of the external granular cell layer, profound hypocellularity. You will probably not be able to even discern the internal granular cell layer. And you can also see uh, viral-induced vasculitis with ischemic damage and large holes in the white matter of the cerebellum. So it's uh, a devastating disease. Amazingly, some of these kids, or kittens, excuse me, are, uh, are born. They can ambulate, but because their cerebellum are not working right, they have very poor motor control, and they tend to be uh, uh, all over the place when they walk, leading to the, uh, uh, the colloquialism of the drunken sailor kittens in animals which were affected in utero by feline panleukopenia. This is an adult, the brain of an adult cat, and there are multiple morphologic diagnoses. First thing that we see are that the ventricles, the lateral ventricles, the third ventricle, and even the fourth ventricle are dilated, and it's predominantly seen the lateral ventricles. They are markedly dilated, so this animal has internal hydrocephalus. And you can also see that there is this bluish gelatinous high protein exudate within the ventricles. And that's because the animal also has a pyogranulomatous periventriculitis and choroid plexitis. And so you have this exudation from inflamed vessels in the periventricular white matter and the choroid plexus, and they are leaking high protein exudate into the surrounding uh, ventricles. And I want you to also think about the distribution of this uh, hydrocephalus. So our first morphologic diagnosis is diffuse internal hydrocephalus. Okay, but why are these ventricles all dilated? Well, to dilate your third, fourth, and lateral, there's only one place that you can occlude, and that is at the mesencephalic aqueduct. And if you have a granuloma caused by feline coronavirus, the mutated feline coronavirus, at that level, you are going to occlude everything upstream, which will be initially your fourth ventricle, then your third ventricle, then eventually the lateral ventricle. So you can identify where the lesion is based on the pattern of ventricular dilatation. And this is a very common place to get granulomas due to feline infectious peritonitis or feline coronavirus. As a general rule, when you have the dry form of feline coronavirus, the animal has good cell-mediated immunity and forms granulomas. It tends to more uh, severely affect the central nervous system. And you'll see granulomas in the choroid, uh, in the brain, uh, and spinal cord, and even in the eye. So this is feline infectious peritonitis affecting the central nervous system of the cat. I talked earlier about cryptococcus infection in the cat. This is another manifestation of cryptococcus infection, and you can see throughout multiple parts of the brain these round 
white, often coalescing, punched out areas. And these are areas of cryptococcus infection which has come up through the cribriform plate. Sometimes you can get it through systemic circulation, but usually it comes through the cribriform plate and you get proliferation of cryptococcus which has this mucoid capsule makes it resistant to phagocytosis. And what you're looking at largely is lytic necrosis. There may be some pyogranulomatous inflammation, but these areas often have very little necrosis due to the ability of cryptococcus to evade the immune system. Uh, in addition to the uh, mucoid capsule, which it produces, which makes it very difficult to phagocytize, cryptococcus also has the ability to utilize catecholamines within the brain, and it will gener generate a melanin-like substance, which the body recognizes as normal and is even more protective against phagocytosis and oxidative damage. So this cryptococcosis, you can see similar lesions in the horse, which is also susceptible to cryptococcus encephalitis, and about 25% of AIDS patients uh, have uh, histologic evidence of cryptococcus in their brain. Okay, I want to finish up this, uh, this hour, or at least this hour for me, with a, uh, a very interesting condition which was identified at Cornell University back in the mid-80s by Dr. John King and uh, uh, by Dr. Della Hunter. And we're looking at the brain of a cat, and you can see on one side you have mild collapse uh, and hemorrhage, and this is due to aberrant migration of the uh, cuterebra larva, that is a, a maggot, and the fly lays the worms uh, around the nares of the cat and migrates up through the cribriform plate, and the very small uh, larval form can migrate around the brain of a cat, often causing uh, spasm and vasculitis in the area of the middle cerebral artery. And I'm not sure exactly why, nobody knows exactly why that particular area is uh, especially susceptible, but it's very characteristically, it can be unilateral or bilateral, and it looks like this in the uh, uh, chronic stage where you have just diffuse atrophy following necrosis of the one side of the brain in the area which is supplied by the middle cerebral artery. The condition known is, is known as ischemic encephalitis in a cat and is a result of aberrant migration of cuterebra, usually, usually cuterebra emasculator uh, larvae. It's a very seasonal thing, is seen in the late summer and early fall, which lends additional credence to the fact that this is the result of aberrant fly larval Okay, we're looking at a, a lesion that's the same lesion, um, and this is uh, what we see. It's not specific to cats. You can see it in any species. And I want you to look at the, the picture on the lower right-hand corner, and we're looking at the foramen magnum, and you can see the brain stem. And right on top of that, peeking out through the foramen magnum, you can see a little bit of the cerebellar folia. Okay, that shouldn't be there. That should be totally within the skull. And if, now if you look at the picture in the upper left-hand corner, you can see that posterior to the, uh, uh, the cerebellum, you can see a, a dark, red, congested, almost triangular-looking structure. And that is that prolapsed cerebellum. It's actually part of the cerebellum, but it's been, you have necrosis. And this is a devastating problem in animals, which is the result of any form of uh, brain swelling. When the brain swells, it is going, there's only a very limited area for it to swell, so eventually you're going to have some positional shifts, and part of it's going to get smushed, as I say. And generally, there are three places where we'll see this. This part, the cerebellar prolapse, which results in what's known as cerebellar coning due to the, to the pressure, is the most common. But you can also, when you have brain swelling, you can see the, uh, uh, along the falx cerebri, you can see a prolapse. If the swelling is in the temporal lobe or the occipital lobe, you can see 
deviation of the lateral cingulate gyrus to the other side of the falx cerebri, which is the ridge of the bone which divides the, the two halves of the cerebellum. Okay, and then you can have swelling which will force the parahippocampal gyri, which is in the occipital lobe, underneath the tentorium cerebelli. So those are three areas which you, where you get prolapse, and that can be the result of any type of brain swelling, whether it's cytotoxic, vasogenic, uh, hypoosmolar, or interstitial. Any type of brain swelling can cause positional shifts due to prolapse. Looking at the neoplasms of the cat, as in the dog, over 80%, possibly even more in the cat of the tumors that you will see in the uh, cranial vault are meningiomas. We're looking at a large meningioma. You can see there has been a positional shift. And meningiomas arise uh, in the, uh, the area of the pia mater, or the arachnoid, and they grow outwards. They're just under the dura, and they will, eventually, they will start by growing outwards, but obviously there's not a lot of room for them to grow. So eventually they will continue to grow and will cause uh, compression necrosis and atrophy of the underlying cerebrum. And you can see that's what's going on here. There is also dilation of the lateral ventricle. So you have a internal hydrocephalus. This is meningioma in the cat, uh, the most common primary tumor in the cranial vault. Now, cats can have other brain tumors. They're, they're not all that common. This is a very nice picture from Tom Van Winkle of an astrocytoma in the cat. You can notice that there is some deviation of structures to the other side. And if you look at the, uh, the border of this, it's not well demarcated, it sort of fingers into the surrounding. You have areas of cavitation, hemorrhage necrosis. So this is a rapidly growing tumor and it is an astrocytoma in the cat. The eye is an extension of the nervous system, so we have to talk a little bit about the eye. And what you can see in this cat, in the, the anterior part of the iris, you have a large white mass, which is causing occlusion of the drainage angle. And this could be a number of things. Lymphoma is often seen in the eye. It tends to be within the iris stroma proper and causes dilation of the, of the uh, and asymmetry of the iris. This one is sort of projecting into the, uh, the anterior chamber. But you'd have to consider uh, lymphoma. I would also consider uh, a number of granulomas diseases, cryptococcosis, and the dry form of feline coronavirus infection would also be considerations. And then you can have some other pretty rare conditions uh, such as ciliary body adenomas or even a melanotic melanomas, but those are exceedingly rare in the cat. Now we talked about melanomas in the dog, primarily arising from the uh, anterior uvea. It is somewhat different in the cat, and this was actually one of my cats as well, and you can note that the uh, usually the golden yellow pigment of the iris is now being progressively replaced by brown to black melanin pigment. And the iris will get somewhat thicker. In the cat, the melanoma rises in the iris. It's referred to as diffuse iris melanoma. And over a period of months to years, that iris is going to get thicker and thicker and uh, be replaced by cells which contain abundant melanin. You can see the cross section in the upper left-hand corner where this iris has gotten thick, has gotten very darkly pigmented. These neoplasms, usually they metastasize about 15%, so they're not highly malignant, but more malignant than in the dog. Um, but usually what happens is the iris gets thicker and thicker and eventually occludes the drainage angle. The animal will develop glaucoma, which will necessitate removal of the eye. This eye from a cat has been diffusely replaced by a large, very infiltrative mesenchymal neoplasm. And cats tend to res respond in a very exaggerated way 
to inflammatory conditions. And we saw the development of the post-vaccinal sarcoma. And that's one example of how sometimes cats just go overboard with inflammatory, you know, they respond to inflammatory conditions with tumors. And this is another case of that. Uh, if you traumatize the lens of a cat, okay, they will develop a malignant transformation of the epithelium on the posterior sides of the lens. And it assumes this, this bizarre mesenchymal formation. And the neoplasm is very invasive and will obliterate the globe. This is known as the post-traumatic sarcoma. So we have post-vaccinal sarcoma. We have post-traumatic sarcomas. There are inflammatory conditions in the gut of cats that they, when you have liberation of certain bacterial agents, mild perforations or ulcerations, they will develop uh, uh, mesenchymal tumors there. So it's just the nature of the cat to respond, in some cases, to inflammatory conditions by forming really bizarre and aggressive malignancies. Here's the eyes from a cat. We can see that there is a cloudiness to the anterior chamber. This is anterior uveitis. Okay, and anterior uveitis is due to leakage of protein-containing fluid from the vessels. And this is the result, in this case, of feline coronavirus infection, or FIP, manifestation of vasculitis, instead of being in the body here, is in the eye, giving us anterior uveitis. This is the wet form, not the dry form. There is a condition that you can see occasionally histologically, which also results in anterior uveitis in the cat, known as idiopathic lymphonodular uveitis. When you cut these eyes in, you just have this really profound lymphoplasmacytic inflammation in the uveal tract. You often have hyaline membranes along the back of the iris, and sometimes it can be so cellular and so thick you can confuse it with lymphoma. And the cause of that is unknown. It's thought that possibly previous infection with toxo may be the cause, but a cause of anterior uveitis. And I would also probably throw in cryptococcosis as a, as a cause of U, anterior uveitis. So you have FIP, idiopathic lymphonodular uveitis, and fungal infections as possible causes of anterior uveitis. This is a very interesting condition. I don't know what the cause is, but this cat has brown or bronze or copper, some people call them copper-colored irises, and this is seen in cats with uh, that are in hepatic failure. Severe hepatic damage uh, will cause this, especially cases of portal hypertension and venous shunting in the abdomen. So copper color iris is very beautiful. Unfortunately, these cats don't last all that long. This is a picture from John King at Cornell University, who happened to have two of these cats, I guess, on the same day. And we are looking at the nasopharynx, just proximal to that towel clamp. And you can see a sort of bulbous polypoid growth, which in this case is coming out of the nasopharynx of both cats. And it's shiny, it is squamous epithelial covered, and this is known as a nasopharyngeal polyp. It's seen in cats with chronic respiratory infections. And it's thought to be an exaggerated response to an inflammatory condition. And you can see one here, um, which is going up the ear canal, the vertical ear canal of the cat. And histologically, they're quite boring. Okay, they're just well vascularized stromal tissue, which covered by squamous epithelium. Um, but you can see them either in the ear by otoscopy or you can see them in the nasopharynx. These animals have chronic respiratory conditions and they sneeze and they snuffle. And uh, eventually, long after the respiratory condition has resolved, they're still doing that. And you find that these have, uh, they have nasopharyngeal polyps. Moving on to the reproductive system. Williams' rule of bubbles, number one in any animal species, but especially in the cat, is that you're likely looking at cystic endometrial hyperplasia. And this is seen in cats, especially cats in zoos, which are put on synthetic progesterone compounds to prevent uh, them from 
having unwanted litters. And uh, there is a very close interaction between the abnormal hormone secretion uh, and bacterial infection, which will result in cystic endometrial hyperplasia. Most animals with cystic endometrial hyperplasia, if you look closely, you will find bacterial uh, endometri endometritis in these cases. And eventually, over time, once that cervix closes again, you may develop a fulminant pyometra. Looking at this cat, we have a torsion of the uterus. The animal could be pregnant or it could have, have pyometra. And generally the twists occur where the horn joins the body. You can see that the veins are markedly distended. The uterine horn is blue because this is venous infarction. Veins have lower pressure normally and thinner walls, so they're more susceptible to any type of, of surrounding pressure. So normally these animals do die, but every once in a while um, the fetus can mummify, and this can be a, uh, a finding when the animal comes in for a spay. So you can find a mummified fetus in something like this. This is not particular to the cat. I think this is much more common in some laboratory animals, such as rats, but we're looking at a large endometrial polyp, and the endometrium is covered, or excuse me, a endometrial stromal polyp. This is a polyp of stroma. It is covered by endometrium. It occludes the, uh, uh, the horn, but it is not a neoplastic condition. This is the mammary chain of a cat, and, and what you can see, the mammary glands are all swollen. They have been incised, and there is marked mammary hyperplasia. This is, can be a spontaneous condition um, of young feral cats, less than two years or less, but is more commonly seen in cats which are given synthetic progesterone compounds, either to pre prevent conception, or they used to be used in cats back when I was in practice um, as a, due to their uh, anti-inflammatory effects. They were used sort of as a, a type of corticosteroid. And they cause a number of problems. The animal will come in for chronic itching or something like that, and you would put them on these progesterone compounds. Magestrol acetate was used back then. And they would develop severe mammary hyperplasia. Some animals would, would uh, even develop diabetes mellitus. The change can be diffuse, usually is. Sometimes it could be focal. Nobody really knows exactly what the, especially in spontaneous conditions, what the hormonal abnormality is. Um, Obviously, progesterone receptors have a, a role, but prolactin has been theorized as playing some sort of role in this. And uh, generally, if it's a spontaneous disease, if you spay the animal, then the condition will regress and you won't have any more problems with it. Moving on to the respiratory system. Okay, we're looking at a cross section through the nasal cavity and the turbinate bones of a cat and you can see that the turbinates are filled with mucus and pus. This is a chronic diffuse rhinitis and sinusitis, uh, commonly seen in young shelter cats or even older cats of vac poor vaccination history uh, in, in, uh, in shelters. And what happens is they're usually affected early on with uh, one of a number of viruses, either Khaleesi virus or feline herpes virus type 1, which causes viral rhinotracheitis, account for about 80%. Okay? And usually there is a secondary bacterial infection. Could be Pastorella multocida, bron uh, Bordetella bronchoseptica, Mycoplasma felis. You might even have Chlamydophila felis. Okay, so this is sort of a mixed bag. And it is not just a sort of a snotty-nosed cat, but these can be extremely bad. They can result in atrophy of the turbinate bones. The animals might become anosmic due to damage to the olfactory epithelium. And eventually, it will probably become a secondary bacterial pneumonia. But this is a very common problem in shelter situations. We're looking at the uh, thorax of a cat, and you can see that the thorax is full of a, a, a brown, fetid, somewhat hemorrhagic, pus, 
and the lungs are collapsed and covered with a thick pseudo membrane. And this is, in one word, pyothorax. In this case, it affected lungs. Sometimes you'll see where it doesn't affect the lungs. It may be unilateral or bilateral. These animals generally, it's a painful condition. And if the animals, you know, sometimes animals may become toxic. Uh, obviously, you have this much pus in the chest. It's just a matter of time until you get ac ac access to the uh, uh, systemic bloodstream. These are often the result of a migrating plant on, far more often than they are the result of cat fights, or it could be a ruptured pulmonary abscess. Uh, this, there are a number of organisms that might cause it. Pastoral multocida, Fusobacterium necrophorum, E. coli, uh, Arcanobacterium or Actinomyces pyogenes, these are all, and rarely you can get some of the, the higher species of bacteria like Nocardia or Actinomyces. But uh, usually it's a mixed population of gram negative and anaerobic bacteria, and they smell to high heaven. Looking at a set of lungs from a cat, these lungs have not collapsed. They are fully inflated, and you can see because they have multiple to coalescing large white nodules. We have an infiltrate of huge numbers of macrophages, and this is a very characteristic picture of pulmonary fungal infection in the cat. Going back to our four common dimorphic fungi, Cryptococcus, Blastomyces, Histoplasma, and Coccidioides. Uh, any of those can cause a this particular condition. Being a cat, histoplasma is the one that I would probably think of first. Now the cat is the natural host for toxoplasma and we, we tend to think that the natural host cannot be infected, but it certainly does happen. Now this could just as easily be dimorphic fungi or this could be Toxoplasmosis, and toxoplasma in all species has a profound necrotizing response. If the animal does not succumb to toxoplasma, then you have a profound reparative response with severe type 2 pneumocyte hyperplasia, and you can get these nodular formations just as easily uh, in cats with toxoplasma. So always think about the possibility of toxoplasma in the natural host, the cat. We're looking at the caudal or the caudal dorsal lobes of the cat, and you can see a large cyst. And sitting within these cysts are two paired flukes. And this is Paragonimus calicati. Uh, in North America, it's calicati. In most of the rest of the world, it's a disease, it's a similar fluke, known as Paragonimus uh, westermanni. And usually this is an asymptomatic infection. The cat has eaten raw fish or crayfish, which is the intermediate host. And the flukes are liberated in the intestine and they migrate to the uh, caudal dorsal lobes. During heavy migration, you might see uh, pleural hemorrhages when the metasocaria migrate into the lungs. But usually the cysts are you know, between seven and 10 uh, millimeters, and they always have a pair of adult flukes. Usually they cause no problem, rarely, because it is a cyst, and they may uh, communicate with uh, an airway. You can have them rupture, and this will result in pneumothorax. But the most case, in most cases, uh, infection is asymptomatic. So this is Paragonimus calicati. The intermediate host is usually the crayfish. This is a, a, a nice picture. I'm going to show you two. This is a nice picture of the lung of an animal that is infected with what is usually an incidental finding in affected cats. And this is the lungworm of the cat, Angiostrongylus obstrusus. And when you look at this, your eye is drawn to the contrast between sort of the whitest frosted areas and the meaty pink areas. And the meaty pink areas are ac actually the, the places where the worms are congregated. In the terminal bronchioles and the alveoli, you will see adult uh, larval worms and eggs. And what happens is it occludes the 
uh, airways and you have atelectasis and collapse and in the affected alveoli granulomas inflammation. In most cases it doesn't cause a problem but you can have a very severe case especially in immunosuppressed animals. So uh, the intermediate host for this is a snail or a slug and, and you get chronic weight loss, maybe some coughing, and you can have sec secondary bacterial infection. And just another picture, even more severe, where the lighter inflated pink areas are what's left of the normal lungs, and the rest is a diffuse catarrhal bronchiolitis and granulomatous pneumonia. So this is Allurostrongylus obstrusus in the cat. This is an older picture from UGA, but we're looking at the uh, left pulmonary lobes of a cat and you can see that there are some areas of hyperinflation or emphysema and some areas of collapse and if we look at it on cut section you will see that the airways are extremely expanded by proliferation of smooth muscle hyperplasia inflammatory cells, especially lymphocytes and plasma cells with some eosinophils, and abundant mucus. And this pattern is very characteristic for a disease known as feline asthma. And when I went to veterinary school, I was taught that radiologically you would see little donuts where the airways are. And now you can see why it gives that radiologic pattern because those airways are surrounded by huge amounts of inflammatory cells and mucus and there is going to be smooth muscle cell hyperplasia and probably glandular hyperplasia as well. So this is feline asthma. Well, there is no good time to have your uh, intestines in your chest. Uh, they tend to, uh, to uh, really give you trouble breathing and you can see in this case the lungs are elevated, they are collapsed and this hernia has gotten to the point where you even have a small piece of the liver which has become uh, gone through the diaphragm and up into the uh, into the chest. It's really an, it's called diaphragmatic hernia but it's an eventration because there is no peritoneal uh, pouch to accompany this material, these organs, which you would expect with a hernia. Uh, in the cat, most of your ventral displacements are associated with uh, car trauma. This is where the diaphragm is very thick. Uh, most of your congenital uh, eventrations are associated with the esophageal opening where the diaphragm is the thinnest, that is up in the dorsal side where the aorta, the esophagus go through. So just looking at the location, I think that it is more likely that we're probably dealing with a traumatic event. We looked at carcinomatosis in the abdomen. This is carcinomatosis in the chest. You can see these, these large nodules, contracting nodules of neoplasm. This is uh, a mammary carcinoma metastatic to the chest. It's not in the uh, it's not in the lung itself, but you can see these sort of pearls of neoplastic tissue all over the pleura. So this is pleural carcinomatosis in the cat. Okay, we want to finish this lecture. We have to go through urinary system and bone. Two things I want you to notice. One is the large number of variably sized cysts throughout the kidney. But the other thing I also want you to notice is look at the color of this kidney. This kidney is not what we expect in a cat, which is sort of a, a rich golden brown. We're looking at white. So this is a condition known as polycystic kidney disease, uh, which is seen in cats, often seen in Persians. Um, and the remaining kidney is sclerotic. The white nature, the white color is given by the tremendous amount of fibrous connective tissue in that cortex. So we have multiple renal cysts and nephrosclerosis as a result of polycystic kidney disease. In Persians, there have been two genes that have been identified as causing 
the autosomal dominant condition of polycystic kidney disease, known as PKM, which is a desmosome component, and PKD1, which is a plasma membrane calcium channel. And loss of either of these genes allows the tubular cells to enter a differentiating mode, which allows sort of unusual unpolarized proliferation of tubular epithelial cells, which eventually would cause blockage, or alternatively may result in apoptosis. So this is polycystic kidney disease, a problem in Persian cats in this species, but we see it in just about any species. We're looking at shrunken, pitted, asymmetrical kidneys, and this is what we generally see with chronic interstitial nephritis. I've always said that if nothing kills a cat first, eventually it will die of chronic interstitial nephritis. These are end-stage kidneys. You see mild hypertrophy. Usually when you see renal failure, there will be a difference in size. You will have, as the animal gets toward the end, mild hypertrophy on one side, the better kidneys. It tries to compensate for the failing kidney on the other side. So there's mild hypertrophy of the nephrons in the hypertrophic size, but eventually the process continues and the animal, once it loses 75% or more of its kidney, proceeds into renal failure. You will see a number of other sequela uh, in these animals. Uh, osteoporosis, parathyroid hyperplasia, as these animals become hypocalcemic. They are hyperphosphatemic first. The body responds by trying to lower the blood calcium this results in stimulation of the parathyroid glands and hyperplasia, excessive results of uh, excessive liberation of parathyroid hormone, which liberates uh, calcium from the bone. Uh, terminally, these animals are hypercalcemic and hypokalemic. We're looking at multiple polyphasic renal infarcts. I see some red infarcts, which are acute, I see some white infarcts, which are chronic in the cortex. The infarcts always point at the occluded vessel, and you can see in the, uh, uh, in the, at the point of the chronic infarct in the cortex, you can see a very nice thrombus in that interlobular artery. So polyphasic, this animal has been throwing probably septic emboli, which will lodge in the kidney. And if I had to look at this particular animal, I would look at the heart. This is a, another great case from Paul Stromberg at Ohio State. And uh, as I recall, this was from a mountain lion with uh, suppurative vegetative valvular endocarditis over time and was progressively throwing uh, emboli into the renal vasculature, resulting in these very nice infarcts. Often, when we see red in tissue, we're not really looking at hemorrhage, we're looking at necrosis. And the hemorrhage is secondary. So whenever, the vast majority of cases, when I see hemorrhage, I interpret it as necrosis. And, and I want you to look at the pattern here. It is not from the cortex coming down. These hemorrhages look like they're coming out of the medulla. The hemorrhage is worse at the poles. And this leads me to the thought that we are dealing with uh, pyelonephritis, an ascending urinary tract infection, and not uh, septic emboli. And all of these foci of hemorrhage contain an area of necrosis or separation. And the reason it is uh, more severe at the poles is at the poles, you tend to have these hairpin-like bent vessels. And bacteria like to accumulate there. And remember the, the medulla of the kidney has a number of things that prime it for bacterial infection, including a high osmo osmolality, which impairs the ability of neutrophils to function in this area, and high ammonia, which impairs complement fixation. So the medulla is primed for a good bacterial infection anytime you have stasis of urine. We're looking at a focal area of papillary necrosis. If this was a horse, 
you would be able to tell me without any hesitation it's papillary necrosis. Same lesion, so it's, it's just as much papillary necrosis in the cat as it is in the horse. In the cat, you don't often see people that give nonsteroidal anti-inflammatories like you see in the horse. It is often due to other problems. Anything that in, can increase pressure in the renal medulla will cause collapse of the very tenuous, easily collapsed vasa recta. So you can see this in association with uh, severe urine stasis, with obstruction due to urolithes, with pyelonephritis, with amyloidosis of the medulla. Anything that causes an increase in pressure in that renal medulla will cause those vasa recta to slam shut. This is an ischemic change. If the animal survives, then it can go ahead and slough this uh, and continue with a slightly widened renal pelvis. There are two significant toxicoses. If you look closely at this, you can see up in the cortex you have these little refractile uh, vessels. And the two that you need to consider are ethylene glycol, which cats used to drink readily. It used to be very sweet. Well, the formulations have changed a little bit, and they put stuff in it to make it more sour. A lot of people are using antifreeze now that does not have ethylene glycol. But that will be broken down by the alcohol dehydrogenases in the liver to glycolic acid, glycoaldehyde, both of which are, you know, will cause marked uh, electrolyte disturbances and metabolic acidosis and usually kill a cat. But if the cat survives, the oxalate, which is released, will complex with calcium and result in uh, acute tubular necrosis. The other crystal formation uh, is melamine crystals, which is a problem that's appeared in the last five years um, due to uh, the reformulation or the addition of melamine to uh, certain additives. Uh, in pet foods to increase the protein levels. And melamine by itself doesn't cause a problem. But in these formulations, there was abundant cyanuric acid. And the concentration of melamine and cyanuric acid was able to precipitate out in the, uh, the convolute tubules of these animals. And it looks a little different because it's more of a chronic renal failure. The animals do not die because of the uh, metabolic derangements like we see in ethylene glycol. So they tend to, to develop chronic renal failure. So the picture is somewhat different generally because the crystals are farther down in the tubules. You have a very streaked appearance, the renal cortex, the pelvis is often dilated. And this is the effect of melamine. Normally, cat kidneys are much lighter than what we see in much most other species due to the high amount of fat which normally accumulates throughout the nephron in the cat. So they tend to have golden kidneys. And one of the very difficult things to diagnose, at least on an image, is amyloidosis. We occasionally see amyloidosis in Abyssinians and Siamese, but in Abyssinian cats it tends to be medullary. It's very difficult to pick up. So. Uh, in a testing situation, this would probably be unfair, but occasionally you'll see it in, uh, in Abyssinian cats. Lumps in the kidneys of cats, and we see them fairly commonly, and the two big differentials that you are going to have are malignant lymphoma and lymphoplasmacytic or pyrogranulomatous vasculitis due to feline infectious peritonitis, that mutated feline coronavirus infection. And sometimes you simply can't tell grossly. But the way I generally evaluate kidneys is I look at the distribution of the lumps. And this one, I can see multiple uh, variably sized lumps in the kidney. They do not seem to have any particular pattern. If you look at this kidney, Notice how these little white raised nodules tend to track the vessels. And because feline infectious peritonitis is primarily, first and foremost, a vasculitis, 
My morphologic diagnosis for this would be a multifocal coalescing pyogranulomatous renal vasculitis with interstitial nephritis. The lesion starts in the vessels and then it eventually spreads into the surrounding parench renal parenchyma. So FIP tends to track vessels grossly. Lymphoma tends to be more random grossly. It's not hard and fast and, and I can't tell you how many times I've been tricked grossly. But eventually we get slides back. We have the ability to look at it under the microscope and it should become apparent. Nice picture from the University of Georgia. We are looking at a cat with a markedly dilated bladder which is full of red urine. And although you have to consider the possibility of trauma because animals with pelvic fractures do not want to urinate, there's often pelvic or urinary bladder trauma and you can have bleeding and they just won't pee. The vast majority of these cases is still due to uh, a condition known as feline urologic syndrome in the cat. This is a cat um, who is on a diet with anywhere up to 1% of dry weight of magnesium, also known as high ash. And it's calculogenic uh, in the cat. What happens is you get formation of struvite or triple ammonium phosphate crystals in these animals. These are sterile, as opposed to dogs and most other species in which uroliths are associated with bacterial infection. In most cats, it's sterile. And in male cats, which have a much smaller urethra, generally the, uh, the uroliths are actually, as we see here, the form, in the form of sand, not large stones, as we'll see in dogs and other species. And they will complex with cellular detritus and TAM horsefall protein, which is produced in the loop of Henle and will form these sort of sandy mucus plugs and result in obstruction, dilation of the bladder, eventual bladder damage and hemorrhage, and is a cause of post-renal obstruction and death in male cats. Doesn't affect female cats as badly because they have wider urethras. And this is a picture of a cat with an accumulation of this struvite urolus, which form like sand. And that would be one of my morphologic diagnoses, truvite urolithiasis. But the other one there is there is a severe diffuse proliferative cystitis. This is a long-standing problem, a lot of irritation, a lot of straining, and you have a proliferative cystitis going on as well. Oh, I'm sorry. I said it was just going to be bone. We have to talk a little bit about endocrine system. In the cat, there aren't a lot of diseases that affect the endocrine system, but one that is of significant import in the cat is thyroid hyperplasia. And you can look at the thyroid here of this cat and you can see on both sides the thyroids are enlarged and there are multiple nodules. And you can call these multiple thyroid adenomas. You can call it adenomatous hyperplasia of the thyroid. Either of those is acceptable to me. Microscopically it looks like regular thyroid with just big follicles. Okay, these animals are thin, they are eating all the time, they are hyperactive due to excessive thyroid production. Okay, this is autonomous release of thyroid hormone. They do not listen to TSH. They will not increase on TSH stimulation. They don't care. The animals have markedly increased levels of, of circulating T3 and T4. There are two mechanisms that will give rise to this condition in the cats. Uh, in the majority of animals, they have increased levels of TSH autoantibodies. And the TSH autoantibodies actually will sit on that thyroid stimulating hormone receptor on the thyroid and, and cause it to turn on. And it's not elevated TSH, but it's elevated autoantibodies to keep it continually turned on. And these animals will continue to crank out uh, TSH. Continued feedback, hyperplasia of the organ. Uh, in some lines of cats, an abnormal protein which mediates TSH receptor signaling, which keeps that receptor continually turned on, has been identified. So two possibilities, but the majority of these cats have very high levels of autoantibodies. And one other thing that you'll see 
is in about 70, well, 75% of these cats, okay, you are going to have uh, changes in calcium homeostasis due to parathyroid hyperplasia as well. Most people don't know about that. So always check out the hyperthyroid. And then uh, um, the other thing that I would, would definitely keep in mind is over 80% of cats with hyperthyroidism have cardiac changes. Okay, and the cardiac changes generally don't regress uh, when the thyroids are, are removed or the animal's put on some, some form of therapy. So hyperthyroid cats, due to the increased me metabolic demand, there will be an increased need for oxygen and peripheral tissues, and there's compensative hypertrophy of the cat, especially of the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy variety. Looking at the thyroid of a cat, your decision is, do we have very large parathyroids or very small thyroid tissue? Because the thyroid is normal color, I tend to believe the parathyroid is very large. And you can also see a small Kirsteiner cyst right there where the parathyroid jo joins the thyroid gland. Um, and that's just a residuum of the third and fourth pharyngeal pouch and of no condition. But these big parathyroid glands, most common cause is going to be a chronic renal failure. Uh, the animal is retaining phosphorus. It automatically, due to mass law, decreases calcium absorption, and the body realizes that. And then the compensatory mechanism is to increase parathyroid hormone liberation uh, in order to mobilize calcium from the bones. So big parathyroids, look at the kidneys, I bet they're going to be very small. We have a neoplasm in the pituitary gland. Pituitary tumors are seen in cats. They're not common, but uh, you can see them. Okay, and I promised we would finish up with bone. Look at the mus musculoskeletal system. Everybody out there, I am assuming, can count. I count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven toes. Okay, so this cat is polydactyl. Uh, it can be a spontaneous problem in cats. Uh, there is a line of cats which live in Key West at the former home of Ernest Hemingway. And they're very famous because they are polydactyl. So you see six and seven toed cats. There is also a line of cats that people actually buy um, called the American polydactyl, which are bred to have excessive toes. So this is polydactyly. It's generally not a, uh, a condition of any type of significance, although I do caution all young pathologists out there to realize that birth defects often happen in clumps. And even something as simple as polydactyly uh, should lead you to look for other possibilities of birth defects. We're looking at the rib cage of two cats or kittens, obviously different sizes, different, different animals. The rib cage on the left is your control. The rib cage on the right, you can notice that on several of the ribs you have multiple nodules, and this is a kitten. And what we, this is a condition known as osteogenesis imperfecta, seen in a lot of different species, but cats and cattle uh, have more severe lesions. And what we're looking at are healed bone fractures, rib fractures that probably occurred during the birthing process. And animals with osteogenesis imperfecta have deficient osteoblastic production of type 1 collagen and also deficient osteonectin. Okay, so they have not only reduced bone mass, but the bone that they form is very weak very abnormal, okay? There is a delay in the compaction of cortical bone. So cortical bone histologically looks like woven bone. And inside the bone, there is much less trabecular bone than you would expect. So it's extremely weak. It breaks readily. It heals poorly. And so what you normally see in affected animals are numbers of broken bones. Here's another kitten, and you can see that uh, 
Uh, you have a break in the humerus, and it looks like you have breaks in the, uh, excuse me, in the uh, in the femur, and it looks like you also have a break in the head of the tibia and fibula. It is not just a problem with bone. You also have significant dental abnormalities and odd formation of the, uh, the tubules within the dentin. So the uh, odontoblasts are affected just as well as the osteoblasts. These animals generally don't make it out of uh, uh, kittenhood due to the severe uh, problems with breaking bones. And if you look at these bones, see how thin they are because you can see the marrow right through them. Well, these bones are normal. They are abnormally colored, but histologically, they are perfectly normal. If I biopsied this or looked at it on necropsy on cut section, probably wouldn't be able to tell that anything is wrong. But these particular cats have darkly pigmented bones due to the deposition of uh, porphyrin within the bone. And the condition is known as... Uh, no, no, I'm blanking. The condition is the result of uh, uroporphyrin-3 cosynthetase abnormalities, and they are unable to form uh, a heme. And the heme is often in an abnormal formation known as porphyrin. It will fluoresce on the UV light. These animals will be... Uh, uh, will, will be mildly hemolytic. You'll have mild hemolytic anemia due to the poor uh, heme formation, and the condition is known as hemolytic porphyria or congenital porphyria. Getting down toward the end, we are looking at the cervical spinal canal of a cat, and we have marked exostosis. This is vitamin A deficiency. Vitamin A in excessive amounts causes increased osteoblastic production of bone and decreased osteoclastic resorption. The lesions are seen in the cervical spinal cord supposedly because of the cat's uh, licking activity, continual stimulation of that periosteum, and this is where you have most severe bone formation, but you can see it in all the long bones as well. We are looking at the abnormal bossing of the frontal bones of a cat with a inclusion body disease. This is feline alpha manosidosis. It could also be mucolipidosis and characteristically have abnormal formation of bones, especially of the skull. Looking at multiple nodules on the flat bones of a cat. We don't see this very much anymore. It was associated with feline uh, leukemia virus. These are osteochondromas. As opposed to the dog, these appear in adult cats, not young, not young dogs, as we see in the dog, and they can undergo malignant transformation and become uh, osteosarcomas. Speaking of, of uh, uh, tumors in the cat, uh, you will not find metastatic tumors unless you look, and we generally don't. In humans, about 60% of cancer patients have lesions in their bones, and one of the best uh, examples of metastatic neoplasia to bone is in the cat. We can see that these digits are swollen. Cats have a pulmonary carcinoma which often metastasize to the digits. So the digits get very large and when you cut them in it looks just like the tumor would look in the respiratory tract. This is metastatic respiratory adenocarcinoma or pulmonary carcinoma in the cat. And we have one Final slide, uh, this is the osteosarcoma in a cat. Not very common in cats, but they do get them. They do not readily metastasize. And the uh, lifespan of a cat with osteosarcoma is much better than a dog. They have about a 15-month median survival time following amputation versus 19 weeks in a dog. So that hopefully covers the... Uh, uh, the gross pathology of the cat. If you have not reviewed the uh, uh, eight-hour DVD collection that I did on gross pathology of the dog, I do recommend it as a companion set because we discuss a lot of the diseases of 
the dog that we also covered in the cat. There are significant species variation. And uh, with that, I thank you for your attention.